colloquium after semester break. And uh, the speaker today is Dr. Wojciech Helwing, and uh, he will tell us about uh, how to falsify called the da uh, dark matter model, and also, also test some uh, alternatives. Hopefully. Please. Thank you very much, Adam. It's a great pleasure to finally be your speaker as an employee as well. I had this great experience two years ago to deliver my first seminar to this audience. Uh, and back then I talked about a different topic because I'm interested in the two biggest challenges in the modern cosmology, I would say. Namely, trying to find an answer uh, for a question, what is the physical uh, nature between two main ingredients of the cosmos, namely dark energy and dark matter, and the hint you already can get from the name we give to them with the adjective dark means that we have completely no idea. We have some guesses, but there's no solid evidence. And this story today will be about dark matter, so it's one branch of my, of my studies. Uh, and the approach we assume, and try to, I will try to convince you that there is yet hope to find some compelling evidence in the sky, not in the Earth-based laboratories for the dark matter. Following the spirit of changing our seminar to colloquium, this is going to be a very general introduction from time to time. I think I only show two or three equations, but these are on the high school level, uh, at least for this uh, high school I uh, attended. <laughs> so nothing very complicated, taking into account the diversity of the audience. So without further ado, please let me start. So this is the adjective that's going to be described later, cold dark matters, just for the purpose of... Uh, not changing the type, but just me think about this as dark matter. So we live in the area of the golden area of cosmology, as there's no doubt that uh, thanks to the enormous achievement on the ob observational side, last 20 years we witnessed a huge e growing evidence, uh, both from Earth-based laboratories like uh, mm, physics laboratories, like for example CERN, also from Earth-based uh, space, uh, from Earth-based telescopes, but mostly, of course, from the space-based laboratories, missions and satellites, including Hubble Space Telescopes and many others. And thanks to this enormous growth in the empirical evidence, we have established something we call now standard model of cosmology. This is a picture with the set of assumptions and physical laws that describes how our universe began and then evolved and created structure over 40 billions of years. So it all started with the Big Bang, then we have some inflation, which is of course just another uh, shaky part of the, of, the, of the model because we still don't have a proof that there was any field like that that caused inflation. Um, but we assumed there was inflation and then the quantum fluctuation source seeded the structure formation seeds that later was taken over by gravity, uh, which worked uh, very patiently for 14 million of years to create this uh, great grand scale, large scale structure of the universe. This is qu quite a, a simple model, but uh, very successful, but we pay a huge price for this success because basically to get these ideas with the old laws of nature we know, we need to assume or uh, accept that the energy budget of the universe looks more or less like this. 68% is something we call mysterious dark energy. This is something that supposedly not clusters, form of a field or energy, maybe vacuum energy, that uniformly fills out the space, have a negative pressure and cause accelerated expansion of the space. And it only becomes relevant for the evolution of the universe slightly six or seven billion years ago. So the first half of the history of the universe, the dark energy wasn't important. Only recently, but recently in the cosmic scales, it take over uh, the, the expansion scale of the universe. But the things also is not so good when it goes to something that clusters and something we supposedly know more, which is matter. Because 20, nearly 27 supposed to be percent of the energy budget is something we call dark matter. What is dark matter? Of course, this talk we're going to be about this, but basically here for, the, for this moment is that a, a form of matter that do not emit or absorb light, neither uh, undergo uh, strong uh, uh, nuclear forces, uh, it uh, feels gravitational of, uh, interactions, maybe weak uh, nuclear interactions as well, uh, and do clusters, of course. So it, it, it basically, this is main driver for structure formation. It's dark matter and gravity of dark matter that then force ordinary matter which now the caution, I'm going to use 
a term probably, uh, I won't escape it, baryonic matter, but for astronomers, baryonic matter means also leptons. So basically everything that is not dark matter, which is in the standard mode of Antarctic particles, we call baryons. I mean, astronomers are notorious for this kind of uh, assumptions, like metals for us is everything above helium. So look, uh, so for example, uh, oxygen is a metal in astronomy. But that's, uh, that's something with the assumption. So this is the 5% we are made of. So this mostly is hydrogen, of course, interstellar hydrogen, and some stellar matter, finally, planets and, and observers, and maybe speakers for the colloquium like today. So this is kind of a cosmic pie. We have uh, something that is 25%. We have no idea what it is, and it's kind of a risky to take a pie if you don't know what it's made of, because you can make, get the misdigestion. And I hope we weren't going to get it, but it's one of the big challenges. It's not also a very pleasant situation in the empirical sciences that we have two phenomena, dark energy and dark matter, of which precise physical nature we don't know much. I mean, dark energy is, a, is, is the bigger problem, but dark matter supposedly is supposed to be an uh, elementary particle. I'll try to explain what kind of candidates we have, but still having been captured in Earth-based laboratories. So it's not pleasant, so we need to work towards the, 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 the finding solution and finding the uh, physical nature of this, because working on the assumption that we assume there's something and still we still cannot capture this, this real particle is not pleasant. I have a question, I think I can answer it now. Take it. It will become apparent later when I discuss the evidence for dark matter when there's going to be slide for the one of the evidence for dark energy as well. So basically, it's just you, are, you build the model, it matches very well many observations under assumptions that this is the... It's a different equation of states, first of all. Ah, okay. So this is, this, is, this is pressurized fluid, uh, perfect fluid, and this is negative uh, equation of state, for example. Okay, so it's a model and then then yes, we'll yes, on. yes. Okay, so first let me just briefly reintroduce what was the, were the classical arguments for dark matter, because this idea is not very new. It's actually nearly 100 years old already, that there's this invisible matter in the cluster of galaxies and in galaxies themselves uh, that keep the things together to do to gravity. And two classical, which are very obsolete now, but it's still oftentimes I see even, even in newspapers that people think that this is the main evidence for dark matter. No, it was just it was the first hint. We have many more. But let me, let me show this classical. So first comes from the, uh, from the uh, velocity dispersion of galaxies in galaxy clusters. Galaxy clusters are the biggest agglomeration of, of visible matter we know in the universe. There's, a, there's a probably hundreds, sometimes thousands of galaxies uh, revolving under mutual gravitational field. This is a coma cluster, one of the nearest big galaxy clusters to the Milky Way. And you can measure the, the line of sight velocity dispersion of the members of the galaxy clusters. And basically, assuming the Maxwellian distribution, you can uh, uh, relate the velocity dispersion to the gravitational potential that binds the galaxy cluster and how we know that they should be in the equilibrium because we see galaxy clusters on many different uh, time scales and distance scales. And if they would, wouldn't be in equilibrium, they would probably dis disperse immediately. I mean, immediately in the cosmic time scale. We observe them on the many uh, different uh, billion of years of evolution, so we know there need to be gravitationally bounded, otherwise they would disperse, all the members would flow apart, I wouldn't see any galaxy cluster. So basically you can assume uh, that the velocity dispersion is basically uh, uh, held by the gravitational potential, and then you get the, very, very f even for galaxy uh, uh, cluster like coma, you get the result that there should be 25 more matter than visible matter from galaxies. Basically this is mass average mass of a galaxy, of a, a galaxy cluster member, and it should be 25 more because uh, to account for the uh, velocity dispersion we'll see. Otherwise, the velocity dispersion wouldn't be uh, uh, reflecting the gravitational potential and the galaxy clusters should disperse. And the other classical agreement c comes from the smaller scales, namely for spiral galaxies that rotate a very thin, disky like objects full of stars that rotate quite uh, uh, different, they have a capital rotation. And we can measure the circular velocity uh, at different radius from the galaxy center. And you c it, it has been done first originally for the, for the very, very nearby galaxies, but now we can measure this for hundreds of thousands of galaxies. And then you can plot basically something we call uh, uh, radial velocity curve. Basically, what is the velocity measured from the starlight 
at the given radius. What is velocity measured from 21 centimeter from the neutral hydrogen that is not in stars, but we can observe in the radio. And then we can plot what is the expectation if only the gravity of the visible gas and stars would be causing the, uh, the motion. So you see huge discrepancy. The galaxies rotate too fast to be stable. They should be ripped apart uh, unless there's something that's so extra gravity that holds them together. And basically, this is because you have the kind of integrated, uh, for circular velocity, integrated equation for mass inside the radius. So, so is the, lower curve? the lower curve is expected just for the visible, uh, yeah, it's, both of them are Newtonian, but the lower one is only if you count what is visible. You count how much mass, visible mass is inside this radius, inside this radius, solve this equation, and you get expected. And this is what is measured. Yes, upper curve is observation. And the feet, of course, because there's so feet, comes from the assumption if there's a much larger clump of matter, invisible, then you can very nicely first fit the observations, but you need to assume there's a much larger invisible component. So first argument came from Fritz Zwicky in the 30s, and for the second is usually accounted to Vera Rubin. Uh, because she was, you know, a very uh, pioneer work for a spectroscopic. But we have moved on from those times. This was, was initial incentive that there's something there in the skies, uh, mostly on the dynamical argument that we need more gravity or something that causes more gravity to, to account for observed velocities. Uh, recently, we have been presented with astonishing, at least in my opinion, uh, uh, and very compelling evidence coming from the lensing observations. So as you know, according to Einstein general relativity, time space is curved in the in, in presence of massive bodies. Basically, you can relate the potential to the in solving the lensing equation, and basically, this bending of, of time space also bends the light. And if you have a far, far uh, and what was observed was something we call galaxy uh, bullet cluster. So this is merging two galaxy clusters colliding each, uh, 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 against each other. And we have observed, thanks to the lensing uh, observations, so basically in the background there was a hundred very distant galaxies. We could measure how the light was deviated. Th therefore, we could get this uh, contour lines that corresponds to the ESO potential. Or gravitational potential, and you have a two centers here. This is at centers of potential. This is where the centers of gravity is. While at the same time, we have observed also the hot gas in X-rays, namely here, which you even see the bow shock here from the very high shock uh, uh, in, um, velocities here. And obviously, you see that the potential of gravity is in different place than the, pot uh, than the hot gas. And it's easy to understand why is the case, because the baryons are collisional. So when you smash them together, they cannot freely move through each other. They heat, they warm up, they have a, a shock, uh, uh, they create shock fronts, while the dark matter is collisionless, and they can freely move through each other. So basically, they only interact gravity. That's why these two clusters went through each other. The dark matter halos are here. Uh, but the gas that was there was shot, heat, shot heated in, in, in and stayed in the center. So this is very compelling because at least we know that there need to, needs to be something that is collisionless. It's not, you cannot really solve this picture by playing with gravity. There were some attempts, but it usually fails. So it's much easier to assume that it fits also the dark matter halo. Uh, Finally, one of the always also very uh, low redshift, so nearby universe evidences comes from the observations of clusters again, but now we don't focus on the velocity dispersion of the galaxy members. We observe the hot gas that emits X-ray uh, uh, photons from galaxy clusters. Why the, the, there is a hot gas in galaxy cluster? Because when the galaxy cluster collapse, there's a huge gravitational potential, and basically this excess potential energy is then changed to the velocity, the kinetic energy. So basically, when the uh, Gaussian, uh, Gaussian, um, galaxy cluster virilize, the gas gets heated because of the gravity. And of course, if the system is in equilibrium, you can relate the, again, gravitational potential to the to the to the temperature and the and the density profile, basically using this is Boltzmann, this is using standard uh, uh, thermodynamics. So we again see the very hot gas; it's bounded to the cluster. But then we see that the mass that was needed to create such a temperature and keep this gas there is 20 times bigger than the visible mass of the cluster. So another evidence for dark matter, something there. And you can see it's quite nice. The gas also follows the potential, so it's nearly spherical. So kind of a blob of dark matter should be there. 
Uh, well, there was many ideas that dark matter might not be uh, just particles. Why you assume there's money need to be exotic particle? Let's assume that, well, there's a baryons and, and we can create plenty of smaller stellar bodies like with dwarf stars or planets that can flu let's, let's call it the cosmic junk. There could be plenty of cosmic junk that wouldn't be visible, wouldn't obscure enough light to be, uh, 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 to be obscuring galaxies it would be perfect dark matter candidate. This kind of a thing was called METRO, so massive compact halo objects, as Herman's love acronyms. Um, and it was proven that it cannot account for dark matter. This, the baryons cannot be dark matter uh, in the presence of small bodies. And Polish uh, uh, Ogle experiment, so it's optic uh, gravitational lensing experiment started by Professor Bogdan Paczynski and then conducted on the Warsaw University using the observatory in Chile, showed that uh, at least in our galaxy, there cannot be dark matter halo move, m m uh, made by these small bodies. And what, how was the evidence uh, uh, presented? Basically, we have observer here in the Milky Way, and the Ogle experiment monitored millions of stars in the Magellanic Clouds, our nearby nearest uh, small galaxy satellite. And they were uh, trying to see for events, uh, uh, what which, which is called uh, gravitational lensing, microlensing. So if there would be a many bodies, compact small bodies, like planets and stars, invisibles, that would cross the line of sight, from time to time, there will be this small lensing event that will basically flicker the, the light of, of the distant stars. And you can count what was the expectation ratio if the whole dark matter should be like that. And the experiment told us that no more than 5% of dark matter in the Milky Way could be made of the, the ordinary matter, thanks to this. So we scratched that. And now, I nearly finishing with the evidence for dark matter, for me, is one of the most compelling. It's that also will, uh, I think, convince you in the terms if you're a particle physicist, because I'm going to show you 40 sigma evidence for non-baryonic dark matter, comes from something we call the causing microwave uh, background radiation. So basically, I told you already in, in, in passing that the quantum fluctuation from inflation in the standard models seeded the structure, uh, seeds for structure formation. And we have a picture how the seed and the structure looks looked like when the universe was only 300,000 years old. So basically when the universe uh, started to expand, the gas, uh, the adiabatic expansion made the gas to cool down. Eventually, the hot uh, the pho uh, photon baryon plasma cooled down at the level when the uh, neutron hydrogen could be created. Basically, the, 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 energy, the energy of the system was temperature went down, so basically the protons could capture electrons and start to form a neutral hydrogen. Once this become uh, 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 basically the, the, the stage in which there was the universe, the universe become in, uh, transparent for light, light decoupled for the hot plasma, and this radiation since then has been traveling to the whole universe for 14 billion of years, and we now measure this, and we, this, is a this is the whole sky projection of the fluctuation, temperature fluctuation of this, of this radiation. It shows what was the structure fluctuations and how the universe looked like when it was only 300,000 years old. It's very nice and neat because if the universe was so young, it was very simple. It's nearly all linear physics. And this is a power spectrum of this fluctuation. So when you compute, uh, when you uh, split the sky in the spherical harmonics, you can look how much fluctuation you have at smaller and smaller and finer and finer scale. So this angular multiple moment tells you this. This is a very large scale, half of the sky, quadruple, hexadecapole, and you go to much larger L moments, so it means much smaller angular uh, uh, harmonics. And this is just a power spectrum, how much fluctuation you have at these scales. The red points are the measurements, and the green line is not the fit to the curve. It's actually the best prediction of the Lambda CDM model. So it's one of the best ever matches between the model and observations without really, really much fine tuning, except, of course, six parameters. So this dark matter and dark energy also comes in here. But we have these three prominent peaks here. First, uh, acoustic peak, second and third. I will tell you why it's called acoustic and why they are very powerful to constraining dark energy and dark matter in the universe. Because this peaks reflects the fact that when, when the, the universe was much hotter, we have this plasma, there was a Thomson scattering, so photons were coupled to uh, uh, hot baryons, and basically because gravity tried to compress the photons and the, this plasma, and then the pressure grew because they were coupled, and the pressure uh, works against it, so we have uh, basically acoustic harmonic oscillations. And you have basically effective mass of this fluctuation, you have an infall, photon pressure uh, push around, gravity squeeze, squeeze uh, the plasma, and basically you have, uh, you have moving harmonic oscillations. So this first peak is compression potential wells, 
basically tells you effective mass of the fluctuations. The second peak is the rarefaction, so basically when the, the whole compression was released because to conserve energy. Finally, the third peak comes from the compression potential hills, which are not shown here. Well, basically, I should maybe change this. So basically, you can imagine that you have potential well and potential hill as well. So when the rarefaction happens, also you squeeze, start to squeeze stuff outside of the potential wells. And now, combination and scale at which these three peaks uh, appear are very sensitive to the two fundamental parameters, namely how much there was a matter in the universe, how much there was a baryonic matter, because one is the potential well doesn't matter if you have a pressure, but the pr amount of pressure only depends on how much baryonic matter you have, because dark matter has no pressure. So I hope this animation, which is courtesy of Wayne Hugh from the University of Chicago, will work. This is what happens with the prediction for the spectrum when you change the baryon amount from very small baryon in the universe to nearly whole uh, ma many, many more barriers than we have now. So you see, the basically, the first peak move g becomes much more prominent. And if there's a fewer bar baryons, then you have a second peak going a little bit down. So that's the first effect you see. Change the amount of baryonic matter, change the mostly amplitude of the, of the first peak. Now, if you change the total matter amount, so also baryonic and dark, the, the, the difference is a little bit uh, more subtle. You still change the amplitude, but now, the, look, the ratio of the amplitude of the third and second peak changed significantly. So you can use this to, to check how much total matter there was. Finally, if you change the amount of dark energy or the curvature of the universe, you will move the angular scales at which the peaks appear. And since we have this measurement so precisely done, this gives you basically this picture, six digits, six numbers, Six, yes, that changed the, that describes the universe for us. That's a standard model of cosmology. Basically, this number tells you how much bar baryons there was, how much total matter there was, what was the optical depth for the last scattering, what was the, what was the um, uh, properties of the initial fluctuations, and basically this tells us, with the uh, CMB, that there's a 40 sigma detection of non-baryonic dark matter. Because we know Uh, it's the derived parameter, uh, because we know that the curvature was uh, very close to zero. And if the curvature is zero, the remain you need to close the, uh, you need to close the, so basically, it's a global curvature. So this, op this omega parameters need to sum up to unity if the universe has the global uh, Euclidean geometry, naming the vanishing curvature. And we know the curvature is vanishing, so basically by, Argument saying uh, that we know the curvature is vanishing, and we don't. We know that there's not enough matter to close the the, the, the density. The reminder needs to be dark energy, but also it changed a little bit, as I said, in this in the peak scale. But of course, it's a it's a it's a very good observation. It's degenerated with the curvature. So CMB, the cosmic microwave background alone, doesn't tell us about dark energy. But this is not the topic of my talk, so I, I won't focus more on dark energy. CMB is not enough to infer dark energy, but it's enough to infer that there's a 40 sigma non-baryonic dark matter detection. Okay. Ooh, I spent 20 minutes trying to convince you that we have a plenty of evidence. There's a weird stuff there, and basically nothing makes sense if we don't assume there's dark matter. But we still yet don't know what the dark matter might be. But we have, uh, what, we, we don't know what it is, but we have some clue what it might be. So basically I would say that this will be the tale about the good, bad, and the ugly, because on the phenomenological level, which was the most uh, of the things I was doing so far, you can divide the main candidates for dark matter into three categories. It can be hot, which we call it hot, which means the particles, it's, it's all going to be particle dark matter. Hot dark matter would have a particle of the rest mass of the order of EV, electron volts, and it would, of course, be very light. Then you can, you can have warm dark matter candidate, then its particle rest mass will be key EV range, kilo electron volts and this will be, of course, medium weight. And you can have a cold dark matter, it means it will be very heavy particle, like in the order of giga electron volts, and this is heavy. And this plots here, which is from clouds to the, to the droplets on the, on the uh, 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 windscreen, to the frost, also have a deeper meaning, because it tells you that if something is hot, means light, it have a much higher internal velocities, which means it cannot cluster on small scales, like, cl like, like the cl uh, vapor. But if something, if something has a much smaller internal velocities, th th that's why there's this uh, 
nomenclature with the temperature. Of course, the dark matter itself doesn't have a temperature, meaning that you cannot stick the thermometer and measure its, its, its temperature, thermodynamical temperature. But it has internal velocities because it depends. If it was light, it was produced at a different epoch of the universe when the universe had a different temperature than it was when it was uh, heavy, meaning. Heavy dark matter retains only very little, very small uh, internal velocities, and it can cluster in all scales. Very light dark matter is hot, meaning it has a relativistic internal velocities, and it cannot cluster unless on the largest scales in the universe. And basically, we have a couple of candidates from the particle physics for these three main categories. For the hot, the perfect candidate was neutrino. First of all, by the way, we know neutrino exists, and it's even better because we know that neutrino have mass. It's a perfect, it's only dark matter that we know for sure that exists because it has all the properties for dark matter. Like few AV, it exists, it has mass. But I will tell you that it doesn't work because it's completely incompatible with the large scale structure of the universe. If the all dark matter would be from neutrinos, uh, there will be no planets, no speakers, there will be no void to bore you here. I will show you a movie later, maybe. Uh, and also with CMB. So we know neutrinos are there, but on the only very, very small fraction of this dark matter. So we, have a, we are left with two standing candidates. We can have a warm dark matter and cold dark matter. For warm, now the main competitor is the so-called sterile Majorana neutrino. It's, it's a particle from, that's coming from the, I think something has been called minimum extension of the standard model of elementary particle. It's an, another neutrino species flavor that is very massive. It's only interact with the other neutrinos. Uh, so it wouldn't be responsible for double beta decay and things like that. It would be in key EV or, or mi EV range, and it would be a perfect candidate for dark matter, and, uh, but it would be warm, right, because it would have some initial velocities. But for cold dark matter, we have a two. The main and uh, longest standing is neutralino that comes from the supersymmetry. It's the lightest supersymmetric pa partner, and it would be of order of 100 giga electron volts. By the way, there's also something called axion, and you can see axion has a very, very small mass. It's completely against what I said to you before. Why axion is called dark matter? Only because these three, neutrino, sterile neutrino, and neutrino, particles were produced in the thermal process in the early universe. So, so that's why their mass corresponds to the thermal relic energy they claim. Axions, if they exist, they, not, they were not produced in the thermal process. So even though they are light, they can still have a very small uh, velocities. So we have sterile neutrino or supersymmetric neutrino, main two competitors, warm and cold dark matter. I'm not sure exactly which particle, because there may be better models, but for me as an astrophysicist, what is most important, they will have a, a, a completely different properties when it comes to the formation of, formation of galaxies and, and structure on galactic scales, which I will try to use to, to tell you that there may, we, we might design experiments that will help us to tell these models apart using the uh, observation. It's even better than that because uh, we have claims from observers that both types of this dark matter were actually discovered. Because if the dark matter is cold and in this neutralino, it's, it's, uh, it would uh, annihilate with each other and annihilation would produce gamma ray radiation and this signal will be proportional to the square of the density because it's annihilation, this is a cross uh, how the cross uh, section works. And we have a claim that there was a gamma ray excess from galactic center that cannot be accounted for anything else, so it was accounted for this dark matter. While if the dark matter would be warm in the form of stellar neutrino, it would produce a decay line because stellar neutrino wouldn't be, um, it would be a metastable particle. It would be stable enough to create the large scale structure, but it would decay at some point, producing 3.5 kV X ray line. And there was a claim that we have this unaccounted for, un accounted by any other atomic uh, lines, a line in galaxy uh, clusters and galaxy, big galaxy uh, centers nearby. So this is the picture of how this gamma ray excess was shown. So this is f there was a, there's a Fermi satellite, there's a gamma ray satellite that produced quite good gamma ray maps, although it doesn't have a very good uh, uh, resolution. So this is the center of our, sat uh, our Milky Way galaxy in the gamma rays. So these are known sources, some pulsars, and of course some other known sources from uh, 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 astrophysical objects. When the old known sources are removed, we, have, we are left with this excess, which supposedly is compatible, what would you expect if the dark matter was cold and would annihilate in the center of our galaxy? Uh, that's just paper saying that there's another very interesting hint that 
at the same time, using different objects though, so nearby galaxy clusters, they, were, they stacked 60 uh, lines for 60 cluster, uh, clusters, observing X-ray from the galaxy clusters, and they claim that there was this excess line, which you see it's very tentative because it's only a few sigma uh, excess at 3.5 kV. But it is 3.5 kV is very interesting because actually it's perfectly much one of the models for stellar neutrino and apparently couldn't be explained by any other known uh, line elements cooling uh, uh, mm, uh, transitions. But I would hazard, I guess, that it's very unlikely that both dark matter models are correct. But it's not impossible because nature has no uh, uh, obligation to play nice with us. But I will work on this, this, this assumptions that we try to distinguish between these two models, saying that one of them needs to be wrong and one might be correct. And how you can do this? So I told you that the, these dark matter candidates have uh, different internal velocities, which means they don't cluster at the same scales. This can be uh, captured by something we use a lot in cosmology, namely the power spectrum of the fluctuation. I showed you the angular power spectrum 2D on the sky from CMB. Now I show you collapsed 3D power spectrum, but we assume the universe is isotropic in the large scale, so we only uh, use one di direction effectively. This is a wave number. Basically, small wave number means very large scales. This is like hundreds of thousands of megaparsecs, so millions of light years. These are megaparsecs. This is galaxy scales. This is super uh, cluster scales. And basically, we have observation from CMB as before, so cosmic microwave, from galaxy clustering. And it's all perfectly matching this black line for, uh, from Lambda CDM, so the standard model for, for cosmology. You can observe also clustering patterns for the large scale galaxy. The problem is that when you try to distinguish between these two models, so warm dark matter would predict that the power spectrum will fall off here in the subgalactic scale because of these uh, uh, higher velocities, while cold dark matter cluster nearly to all scales scale up to here, to, this, to the Earth, uh, uh, to the planet Earth uh, scale. Of course, the, 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 uh, the scale at which this warm dark, dark matter model falls off from the, from the cold dark matter depends on the mass and some assumptions you can make how the matter was produced. But basically, for the most viable models, it, the difference appears in the subgalactic scales, which are highly nonlinear. So basically, we have no way to sit down with the pencil, with mathematics of anything, to predict what's going to happen there, because it's a many-body interaction for 14 billion of years in gravity. So we, the only solution we can use here for to rise prediction is supercomputer simulations, and this is what I do for a uh, living. So we can use the supercomputer uh, simulations to get the predictions, but just bear in mind just one plot that uh, we can produce very nice fake galaxy uh, data using simulations, and this plot shows you that. The real galaxies, the observer is always in the center, so this is distribution of galaxies. Uh, the farther you go from the center, the, the, the galaxy lies farther away from us. The blue uh, dots are some kind of, some real galaxy surveys, like two, two degree field, Sloan, great, Sloan Digital uh, Sky Survey. The red ones are the one we create in the computers. So we can perfectly well, on, I mean, this is only chi by eye, but I told you, even in statistical sense, match the observations using our model. The problem is that the dark matter doesn't play a role here, that is, if it's cold or warm, because both of them only predicts the differences on the subgalactic scale. So we cannot use this beautiful observations to distinguish in between dark matter. So what we can do, as I said, you can take the initial conditions from universe, which we know pretty well. You can take some learn, uh, train personnel to run super computer simulations, get some predictions, not only from galaxies, but also for the structure of galaxies, and hope to learn where you can look for the hints of the dark matter uh, candidate. And I'm going to tell you about this two those kind of simulations I did. First is something we called Copernicus Complexio. The simulation, very large simulation, was run in the uh, ICM of the Warsaw University. This is uh, so-called zoom-in simulations. That's why you have a big blob of a very high resolution in the center. And why we use this kind of thing? So we have a low resolution outside and only kind of a zoom-in uh, region of interest because when you do computer simulation in cosmology, you immediately run in the very big conflict. Namely, you would like to simulate as large as possible part of the universe to, to get away from something we call cosmic variance. 
basically we need to have a representative uh, region of universe, but at the same time you want to resolve the elements that are important for galaxy formation. And of course, because computer memory is limited, not unlimited, uh, you run in the conflict. The larger region you simulate, the lower resolution you can do it. So the kind of a compromise is here that we do the large region of the universe in the low resolution just to get the gravity right everywhere, but we put a sphere of interest in the center to get many, many Milky Way-like objects resolved pretty well. And why Copernicus Complexio, which means conundrum? Because we wanted to know if the Milky Way is a very special galaxy, like Copernicus would like to teach us that we're not special, we, are, we already know this, but maybe when it comes to dark matter, we might be special. So that was the, the uh, motivation. We run cold and warm dark matter models. This warm was 3.5 uh, keV line equivalent. And we try to look at the differences. And this is going to be movie for poor, which you told Z is so-called cosmological redshift. The higher this number, the earlier the time. The lower this number, the closer it is to the present day. And you have a formation of the halo, like Milky Way halo, in these two models at two different epochs. So basically, at very early times, there's some fluctuation. You can see a little bit more maybe granular structure in the cold. But why, while the time progress, you see the structures form, the big halo, there should be galaxies here, form here and there. But finally, at redshift zero, you see they have perfectly good two Milky Way halos. This would be a something, this is how the dark matter halo of our galaxy could look like if we would have a dark matter telescope. You see the big satellites are more or less in the same places, but one model predicts that there's many small specks. Well, Perfect, I found the solution. Let's go to telescopes and count the satellites we have in the Milky Way, because this model predicts there should be hundreds of satellites, or 200, and this model predicts only should be 20. We can count the satellites, and problem solved. Let's go for coffee, or go for Nobel Prize. Well, of course not, it's not that simple. Uh, so, this I already told you that, that in this subclumps there should be satellites, and we can use the observed uh, population of Milky Way satellites. This is just a family photo of the small children of the Milky Way with the very known uh, dwarf spherical satellites of the Milky Way. This is quite outdated picture because I think it comes from 10 years ago when we knew 25. Now we know nearly 50 satellites of the, of the, of the Milky Way thanks to uh, new surveys. But I will skip this slide, but just it's not so simple to just count the things because it's not so easy to make galaxies in our universe. Uh, it's because you have all this gas-related nonlinear physics that happens, so you need to cool, cool down the gas because stars cannot form from hot gas, so you need, and the gravity always uh, warms the gas. So basically, if you're a very small clump, it might be difficult for you to create, uh, to create a, a galaxy. And we did this modeling, basically we included this different kind of a gas uh, cooling, gas pressure, supernovae, uh, even we put supermassive black holes in the center of our simulation to see what's going to happen, what kind of a galaxy we can predict. It's a very complicated recipe, I won't bore you about this, but when you ap we, we apply this to our simulation, we got this follow following plot, and it's a very simple plot. On this X line, we have the predicted luminosity of the, the satellite galaxy, basically how many stars, how bright the satellite galaxy is. So we know that we more or less see all galaxies down to minus five now. On the y-axis, this is a just cu uh, cumulative uh, uh, function, is how many galaxies of this luminosity you expect to be. So basically here, I found the cross-section. In this model, we expect 10 uh, galaxies to be of the luminosity of minus 12 of brighter. Uh, the dashed line is something we know from observations when we account that we don't see the whole sky because the galaxy obscures. And this blue and red line are two diff different models. And of course, there's a, another, par another parameter here because we know, don't know a priori how massive Milky Way halo is. We know some only with some, uh, some uh, uh, margin. This means that and because the more massive halo is, the more satellites you predict we need to play. So this is a very massive version of the Milky Way halo. This is a very light uh, version of the Milky Way halo. But the takeaway message is, it doesn't matter what's the mass of the Milky Way halo, because two models predict nearly the same number of satellites. The only difference is here, maybe, that on very fine end, the dark matter that is cold predicts many more satellites. But, of course, we, there's, not op there's no way we can observe anything that is so dim. So, why... Sorry? No, we already predict this in the V-band magnitude. So what is the 
we have we yeah, more or less, yes. Yeah, yeah, more or less like that. We have a stellar mass in a different. Uh, we know what metallicity, so we can predict also the colors. Uh, this is how it's done. Yes, yes. And why is that? Why I, s I told you that one model predicts hundreds of these clumps and one not because it's very hard to make galaxies in, the un in our universe because it had a very nasty epoch in its history, which we call reionization. There was this epoch when the first uh, population of stars, which actually was the third population in the astronomy nomenclature, as an astronomy wants to conf want to confuse everybody, there were first stars that were created after the Big Bang. There were very bright, uh, very large stars that very quickly exploded and created supernova and probably black holes. But they produced enormous amount of ionizing photons, UV, most radiation. Basically, they ionized this, this neutron hydrogen means that it heated the gas between galaxies in Austin galaxies to the 10,000 kelvins. And if you are a small clump, and you don't have enough gravity to keep this hot gas, your hot gas will flow away from you. If you have a big clump, your gravity is enough to keep this hot gas. Eventually, gas will cool by emitting radiation through metal lines, which means if you're small enough, this guy would never create a galaxy because it's, its gravity is too small to keep this hot gas. It's just kind of a threshold, kind of a filter that filters out the galaxy formation in the small clumps. Uh, I think I won't have time to explain it, but of course we used some recipes, so we wanted to make sure that we know what we are doing. So we also employed state-of-the-art hydrodynamic uh, uh, simulations, because I previously only, sh only showed dark matter simulations that we used some recipes to fill with stars. Now we did everything self-consistently, so we follow gas, supernovae, we, can, we follow, follow dark matter, follow black holes. And this is a picture we can get. For a Milky Way and Andromeda, like local group of galaxies, this is dark. if we could see dark matter, it would look like this. And this is what the simulation predicts in the stellar light. So basically, you see thousands in cold dark matter, thousands of clumps, but only a few handful of satellites. Uh, and we did the same with the warm dark matter. Again, the evidence was that you cannot, basically, I was keeping, you cannot use counting the objects to distinguish between these two models. Of course, we were a little bit shocked because for the many years, for decades, it was kind of a, a, a common knowledge that this different dark matter models predict different number of satellites, and it's very easy then to distinguish. No, because the baryonic physics is complicated, because galaxy formation is complicated, it's, it's not so simple. Even though the dark matter two models have a very different uh, uh, predictions for number of these clumps, most of these clumps in one model wouldn't make galaxy, so you cannot distinguish them between them by counting the objects. So this is not at the end of the story, because I'll leave you with the positive message, and this is with the reminding few minutes I will, I will sacrifice on, because we can use the same failure for our success. And how to do this? Skip that. This is the same from the hydronic simulation I, I showed before, but instead of, velo uh, of luminosity, we plot velocity. Basically, velocity uh, of the internal velocity, maximum circular velocity, tells you what's the size of the gravitational well of given objects. I mean, if, we, if you don't want to do it with uh, luminosity because it might be not convenient. The black line, so this is a cold dark matter model and two warm dark matter models. I mean, let's focus on this one because this is already extreme. It's from the paper. So basically, we have a Milky Way and its satellites, and the black line show you the, uh, so there's a hundreds of different Milky Ways here. That's why you have a hundreds of lines. Each line here corresponds to one satellite of the, of the Milky Way in these two models. The black lines are those that created stars, that those that we can expect can be visible satellites. The gray lines are those that never created a visible satellite. So you see, if you go to the very small guys, cold dark matter predicts hundreds of those uh, small guys that never created galaxy, while warm dark matter predicts only 20, or five times less. And it was already shown in our simulation here, which I put something we call satellite mass function. So this is the mass of the satellite, and this is how many satellites of this mass you can expect in the Milky Way halo. Uh, and basically, this is warm dark matter we, st we studied. This is the black lines are the cold dark matter. It's a huge difference, right? It's two orders of magnitude in, if you go to very small, very light satellites. But even still, at this relative 10 to 7, 10 to 8 solar masses, is a relatively big satellite. It's still uh, absolutely observable at some point. There are still differences. So how we can use this to actually learn what is the dark matter? Well, we go again to the lensing, we, thanks to old Papa Einstein. We, but this time we're going to use strong lensing system. The strong lensing system is when you have a uh, system in which you have a very strong deviation of the, of the, of the uh, light bands 
uh, of the faraway galaxy. We look for a system, this is, this is shown for galaxy cluster, but I told you we won't, we're not going to do it on galaxy cluster. We look for a very massive galaxy, can be elliptical galaxy at the best, because this galaxy should have many small clumps as well that will create very strong lens, so distort the picture of the faraway galaxy, background galaxy, we can, which we can observe at Earth. And we look for systems like that, which creates a perfect nearly Einstein ring. So this is a very strong lens system. You have a very massive elliptical galaxy with some dark matter halo here. You have a very distant galaxy which has been distorted because it perfectly hit the, the, the combination of the geometry of the system to create this strong lens. And now, the point is that because here there should be these thousands of the small invisible uh, clumps in cold dark matter, but there should be only few of them in warm dark matter, you can play and predict what should be the properties of these distortions here. Because if, even if there are small dark matter clumps, they still make gravity, they still distort light. So basically we look for the, 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 the um, deviation in this strong lensing system because one model predicts there should be many more these small clumps. Uh, we can use them to tell the difference. So this is the money plot for this colloquium. It's quite complicated, but I will walk you through it uh, uh, slowly. First, what we plot here on this line is the projected surface number density of dark matter halos. The, 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 this one that are dark, they don't have, because if they are not dark, we see there the are some satellites in the, in the elliptic galaxy. Uh, on this line, we plot the minimum, also let's say, cut off halo mass. One model says that there shouldn't be, uh, so Warner matter model says there shouldn't be any halos or very few halos with the mass 10 to the 8 solar masses. And that the cold dark matter model says there should be plenty of halos with this mass. So that's why if you project the surface density uh, for cold dark matter, you get the cigar shape, because there should be plenty of halos below this threshold. While for warm dark matter, you should nail down on this cutoff, because the warm dark matter tells you there's a characteristic scale below which you don't have any structure, right, because of these velocities. The big contours are if you would have 20 systems like that, we only know four, by the way. That's the uh, not so optimistic way at the moment. If we knew 100 systems like that, we can tell the difference between the models in the following way. If the dark matter is cold, we could rule out the warm dark matter at many sigma level, right? Because we would be in this situation. We would measure that the minimum halo is somewhere here. There's many sigma away from what is the predicted. But if the dark matter is warm, we would be arriving here, and we will rule out cold dark matter at least at three sigma. It's, it's very strong, stronger than what we can get. What's the problem? The problem is we only know four systems like that at the moment. We need 20 to get here, but don't get the spur because we have the large scales, uh, no, large synoptic sky uh, survey telescope. It's going to be a robotic telescope. It's a big project run by Americans, but also recently Poland, thanks to Professor Agnieszka Polo, joined this effort. I'm also a member. And because it's automatic robotic system, it's, why it's only no four system? Because it's very, very hard. It's, it's only separate serendipity to discover something like that, because you need perfect geometry. So you need to know all the sky, but in, sky is very big, really, if you really look through this by telescope. But that's why you need a very precise robotic telescope. This large sky synoptic survey telescope, it's forecast to detect from 50 to 200 of those systems in the next five or seven years, let's hope. So I will probably will try to come back to the, with the colloquium in five or seven years to you and say, look, we falsify one of these models with that many sigma. If not, you can tell your colleagues that Helving doesn't know what he's saying. Um, I will leave you with my conclusion here, basically just very quickly uh, summarizing. Even though this dark matter is still a very compelling uh, challenge, we know we have some hints what should be the differences when it comes to the structure formation at galaxy scales. These models have uh, two very prominent features First, th that differentiate. One is that they have these internal velocities that the particles are different, so you can try to look also in the, in the uh, Large Hadron Collider. But at the same time, because they have a different rest mass, they will produce different structure on subgalactic scales. Unfortunately, as I try to convince you and I hope convince you, you cannot use the counting the satellites to tell the difference, even though the predicted structures are very different, because the galaxies are very complicated to form, and it's not so easy in our universe. But you can use the same argument that one uh, uh, model predicts many more dark, we call this dark substructure, if we are lucky enough to find 20 or 50 uh, systems of strong lensing, as I showed you. So hopefully, not for me, but for in 20, 10, 15 years' time, we'll know much more about dark matter. Maybe someone will get the ticket uh, to Stockholm. Thank you very much for your attention.
And waiting for your question, I will show you the movie, which I promise, and it's very bad to promise a movie and never deliver. Which is basically, oh, which is basically not working that brilliantly. So this is what you can predict from two simulations from Milky Way like Halo. This is very high resolution. Hundreds, thousands of small clumps in cold dark matter, very few of them in warm. But I wanted to show, leave you with a different movie, which is this one. And I will answer your question. This is a movie showing, going through the billions of years of cosmic evolution, how the structure forms in these different dark matter models. Um, are there any questions? Uh, so what is a typical mass and typical size of these dark halos you expect near, let's say, Milky Way? Uh, you mean those that never created galaxy? Uh, so they are, for the, for the, for the cold dark matter model that, has, uh, that is currently part of the main paradigm, this should be something uh, below 10 to the 7, 10 to the 6 uh, solar masses. So millions of, or 10 millions of solar masses. Because more massive would, should create some galaxies. We know about the dwarf satellites which are called ultra faint dwarf. They all have only have thousands of stars inside them. And we know that they have like 10 to the 8, 10 to the 7 solar masses. So are the, they're on the edge. But the warm dark matter model, uh, it's not like the, it predicts non-halos on this one. It's of course, as a, any, any process in nature is a Gaussian kind of a curve that uh, uh, filters out. So if at 10 to the 7, the warm dark matter predicts that's the five times less than cold dark matter, but at 10 to the 6, already 100 times less. And of course, at 10 to the 3, which is not observable, it's thousands times less in one model than the other. But it's not just like sharp cut of this, this one model predicts none of these objects. So you need to use stat results of statistics. More questions? Uh, maybe Agnieszka now. So I just have a technical question about your simulations. You say that you have um, a finer resolution close to the clumps, and far away from these clumps you have um, uh, more rarefied uh, grid. So are you using adaptive mesh refinement, or how many levels, or uh, is it a different technique? To, to, to some extent, yes, but uh, adaptive mesh refinement is only, it's not adaptive. Basically, you, you create a mesh because you know the resolution uh, 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 beforehand. You design the resolution. So there's a, uh, well, we don't have anything to, pro oh, there's a table is over there. So very quickly, very sketchy. You take, the universe is cube, of course, as you know, because only cubes fits in the computer. This large scale structure is everywhere. This is a uh, this is the periodic boundary condition. But we put the sphere of uh, of high resolution in the center. Of course, around it we need to have some intermediate region. So it's uh, so this is the highest resolution is here. That's the highest grid. But the grid is not the main. Uh, uh, it's, it's a Lagrangian code. So we we discretize the mass. We use the grid only to go smoothly from high resolution to low resolution. So basically to count the um, to count the gravity well when you go from the high resolution to the low resolution. You don't need adaptive because you know that the low resolution you will have, for example, let's say 100 times less resolution than the high resolution, so you can design it, you know, before the running. Although, as in some simulations, we use adaptive mesh refinement, but this is for modified gravity dark energy I'm doing, so not for this project. Um. Are there any other causes for the distortion of the Einstein ring? In, if yes, how can you distinguish with the, the number of, you know, of the halos? Uh, okay, that's a very good question, of course. If the lens is far away, then it might be the case there will be unresolved satellites, still visible satellites. That's why you need to count for the relatively nearby uh, lenses. But that's why we also don't go for the uh, 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 spiral galaxies, because they have a distortion in shape, which would make this modeling much more complicated. We look for the uh, old, dead elliptical galaxies that probably don't have enough internal structure. It's well known for the nearby universe they don't have internal structures, that the modeling is, is uh, supposed to be failed proof for this kind of uh, unresolved, visible, but uh, still satellites. But there's this fine line where you might say that, well, there might be some that you don't. It's always part of the modeling. So uh, 
you take it with the pinch of salt. That's why, that's why I say we only know four systems that could make this test because we know more uh, uh, Einstein rings systems, but the lens is too far to be sure that the distortions can be only accounted for those that we, the satellites we don't see, right? But any other distortions uh, in the pro like projections wouldn't make this effect because it has to be very close to the lens. So it's either dark halo or unresolved uh, visible satellite. At least I don't know any other way to, to make distortions like that. Okay, any more questions? If no, let's uh, thank Wojtek once again. Thank you for having me.